So hello everyone and welcome to this new meeting of the series of the Finance Network titled In Conversation, Exploring the Philosophy of Money and Finance. And this series uh, features several, several interviews and today we are excited to host Marco Meyer from the University of Hamburg, who will be interviewed by Lisa Varensky from CUNY Graduate Center. Um, thank you very much, Marco and Lisa, of course, uh, for accepting our invitation. And today's interview is titled Credit and Distributed Justice. And this is inspired by a chapter ordered by Marco in the recently published book, The Philosophy of Money and Finance of York, for Oxford University Press, edited by Jorgen Sandberg and Lisa Varensky. And as usual, after the interview, we will have a debate uh, and you can ask your question raising your virtual hand by clicking on the, bot bottom, uh, the bottom of the Zoom menu. And then we manage the queue. And so that's all uh, from me for now. And let's begin the interview. Enjoy it. Thank you. All right, so I'm very pleased to introduce to everyone Marco Meyer. Marco is a principal or the principal investigator of a research group at the University of Hamburg. And his research team investigates what organi organizations have a duty to know and which qualities help them to fulfill these duties. His research draws on philosophy, economics, psychology, and data science to address a range of ethical and political issues. So some of the questions that he takes up include the following. Which institutional reforms can make capitalist societies more just? How can organizations make ethical decisions and avoid misconduct? Which qualities help people avert conspiracy theories, fake news, and misinformation? I'd like to mention that Marco has just finished a book manuscript co-authored with Dan Halliday on the ethics and politics of the credit system. Marco has two PhDs, one in philosophy from the University of Cambridge and another in economics from the University of Groningen. He has a master's degree in philosophy from Oxford and BA degrees in philosophy and economics and European history from Bayreuth University. Okay, so the topic of credit and distributive justice is something that Marco's been working on for quite some time. And in his chapter um, in our, our edited volume, he addresses some questions, well, specifically the following questions. Does the credit system make society more just or less? What are the effects of credit on the distribution of economic burdens and benefits? And how does the credit system affect poverty and inequality? Okay, so Marco, before we delve into these questions, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about some of your earlier work on the right to credit, namely the right to access credit for creditworthy purposes at reasonable rates. Um, could you, you know, tell us a little bit about this? Specifically, we might like to know why it is that we have a right to credit and how is this ability to access credit benefit to an, excuse me, beneficial to an individual. Thank you, Lisa, very happy to. So when I started to work on, on the credit system, the first observation that I made was that everyone um, working on distributive justice was thinking about the distribution either of income that people receive through labor or through other means or wealth, and wealth redistribution. And it occurred to me that there is another kind of money, another way of commanding resources, namely through access to credit. Credit is a little bit different from getting income or having wealth in that you need to repay it. But um, it, for the duration that you've been granted credit, you can command resources in excess of what, what you otherwise could. So that I found really intriguing. And then I was, I was wondering how you can build this into theories of justice. And the basic argument for the right to credit is simply this, it's a contractualist argument. So an argument that wonders what are the terms on which we should organize the economy so that they're acceptable to everyone involved. So the thought is, most societies accept private property as a basic principle for, for organizing their, um, their economies. This is can be more or less extreme, but essentially all economies that 
people that will listen to this talk live in, um, give a really important place to private property. And that has a lot of benefits, but it also comes with a real downside. And the downside is that it excludes everyone who doesn't own a particular thing from access to that thing and the use of that thing. So it's an incredibly exclusionary um, principle. And not only for poor people, also rich people are excluded from almost everything because nobody owns uh, more than a tiny fraction um, of, um, of the overall assets. So the question is, is there, is there anything that we can give to people to mitigate this downside of exclusion? And the answer is, there's a thing, and that is credit. Credit is the way of almost commanding resources that you don't own. When someone extends credit to you, you have a duration of time um, where you can command these resources, and that mitigates to a certain extent the exclusion from private property. So if you are faced with two societies, one realizing private property without giving people a right to credit, and one where there's private property, but there's no right to credit, if you have the choice between the two, then people have reason to reject the letter, and therefore people have a right to credit. Okay, good. So I want to give a just a brief overview of your chapter, and then we'll, we'll get into some of the details. So in, in the um, chapter, you focus on retail credit, and you argue that cheap credit on commercial terms is only available to people in the upper half of the wealth distribution. But you go on to argue that credit can play a positive role in society if entrepreneurs who borrow create jobs or if states borrow to fund programs to address poverty. And ultimately, you conclude that the credit system does make society more just, but whether and how depends on other parts of the economic system. So the story is going to be something of a nuanced one. And um, to begin with, in order to answer these questions about whether the credit system promotes or impedes distributive justice, we need some standards of evaluation, which you, you say early on. And I, want, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit how you understand distributive justice and how we should evaluate the institutions that determine it. Yes, absolutely. So distributive justice, I, I think about that essentially is the study of how institutions distribute economic advantages and economic burdens between people. And um, very often, as I said, we focus on income and we focus on wealth, but I think we should also really think about access to credit. And as you say, the story here is really nuanced. On the one hand, credit can be this powerful tool for empowerment, can be this powerful tool for empowerment because even if you don't have much money, you might get credit and that can allow you to buy a house, get an education, bridge a financial gap and so on. But on the other hand, for rich people, it's easier to get credit. So it can also reinforce existing disparities. So when it now comes to, to evaluating that, right? So how, how does credit influence how burdens and advantages are distributed in society. We can look at a lot of different principles. You know, philosophers um, have, have come up with a whole range of possibilities. I think it's really important to, to bring this research into contact with empirical research on the impact of the credit system. And here, the two things that researchers mostly look at is the impact on poverty and the impact on inequality. And I think those are also the two um, that, that we should focus on here. Okay, good. Now, you, you be begin by making a really important distinction between secured and under unsecured credit. And you say that cheap long-term credit is typically secured and secured credit is only available to those who have the means to provide the needed security. So let's talk a little about this distinction between secured and unsecured, and in particular, what kinds of credit extensions are secured and what kinds are unsecured, just so we have an idea of what, what sorts of um, you know, credit facilities you, you have in mind here. Yeah, so it's a, it's a distinction that, that I got from the economist Bengt Holmstrom, um, 
And once I read this paper where he introduces this, there, there was really this light bulb going off in my head because the credit system is a very complicated place, right? There are all of these different kinds of credit. There's there's different there, there, there's credit to households and to companies and to states and then some of it is really cheap and some of it is really expensive and it's hard to make sense of it all and so this is a very simple distinction that is important not only for what is this what it distinguishes but also what it doesn't talk about so it really cuts along an axis that that is really critical for for this justice angle secured credit is what many people think of as respectable credit, right? So this is mortgages and maybe auto loans. Um, it is um, the, the kind of credit that requires collateral. And because in case you don't pay up as a borrower, the bank can um, size your collateral, uh, get, you know, get your house, get your car. It is cheap. It is cheap because there's a security on the other side, and that not only gives the bank um, the assurance that it can get the principal back, it also re reduces the cost of monitoring and of assessing how uh, trustworthy you are because there's always this asset that can fall back on. And on the other hand, there's unsecured credit that many people think of as the ugly sibling of the respectable secured credit. This is credit that you're granted without collateral, and it comes with much higher interest rates, an order of magnitude, higher interest rates, shorter terms, usually shorter amounts. So this is credit card debt, personal loans, to certain amount, certain extent, student loans, payday loans, these kinds of things. That makes sense. And again, a reminder that your topic is retail credit here. And so these are, you know, the kinds of characterizations that do ap apply to that market. Okay, you had you mentioned that this cheap long term secured credit is um, available just to those who have the means to provide the collateral. And then you go on to say that people in the bottom half of the wealth wealth distribution typically, do, excuse me, don't have it. And you rely on some of the work of Thomas Piketty, which is, is very interesting in this regard. Could you just maybe briefly summarize what you know, Piketty's findings were here? Yeah, so here's this really thick book um, that very many people <laughs> have in their bookshelf and that probably fewer people have read. In this very thick book, there are like these two paragraphs where he says like, okay, bottom line, here are the stylized facts, right? What I found over these 150 years um, um, where I studied economies and looked at the distribution of wealth and income, all of these different places, this really long time window. What I find is that the bottom 50% across all of these different uh, data sets own virtually nothing. And that means if you don't own anything, you also can't provide collateral. And that means you are mostly excluded from secured credit. On the other hand, the, the top 10%, they control 60 to 90% of wealth. So relatively egalitarian societies are those where the top 10% only control 60% of wealth and less egalitarian societies are those where they control more like 90% of wealth. And this is a group that has very easy access to secured credit on very favorable terms but they also have access to all sorts of other um, financial instruments. Um, in the middle, there's 40% that you might think of as the middle class, if you, if you like. They hold a modest amount of, as uh, of assets. Um, and for them, it makes a huge difference how the credit system is organized, how, for instance, the mortgage market is organized. Um, and mortgages are incredibly important for them. So I think those are the stylized facts. And it's, it's very interesting to think about what group the people that mostly study this, like most people on this call, including myself, belong to. Most of these people are in these middle 40%. And they're really worried about you know, mortgages and access to that and so on. 
And then it's very easy to forget that for half of the population, the kinds of credit that we have access to aren't even an option. Okay, good. <clears throat> I want to just, before we go on to the topic of unsecured credit, read just one quote that comes in page 255 of your chapter, just to summarize you know, your, your thoughts on the matter of um, secure credit. So you write, enthusiasm for the potential of credit to advance distributive justice is due to the mistaken assumption that the attractive terms of secured credit can be made available to borrowers, borrowers who lack collateral. Similarly, some moral indignation about high interest personal loans is grounded in the mistaken assumption that lenders pocket high interest payments as profits. Neither is warranted. And anything you'd like to expand on this before we move on to unsecured credit? So this was this um, this light that yeah, went light, yeah. <laughs> in, in my head when I read this paper, right? Secured and unsecured credit. It's not because the banks are mean that they make credit so expensive for people that can't put up collateral. It is because they don't have collateral. You need to pay for cheap interest rates in some way. And that is to promise that the bank gets access um, to, to the underlying asset in case you fail to pay up. And you can do lots of financial engineering and you know finance for good and so on and so forth, but you can't overcome this basic, this basic problem. And that comes out um, even in uh, the microcredit movement and so on, where you always need to find some sort of way in order to make loan terms work even though people can't put up collateral. Um, that also limits the, the impact that um, these, these kinds of ideas can, can ever have. Okay, good. Now, thinking about unsecured credit, um, given that unsecured credit is usually expensive you know, to, to individuals, one might expect it would likewise do little, very little to benefit the least well off. In fact, when you think about the interest rate burdens of payday loans and credit card debt, um, it looks like it's going to be harmful, but you do identify some ways in which unsecured credit can be beneficial to the least well-off. Can you explain some of these ways? Yeah. So, so maybe first to reiterate what, what, what you said, Lisa, I think it's important to realize that unsecured credit is generally about managing poverty. It's not about, not about escaping poverty. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't address the root causes like low wages. It normally can't give you a loan volume that is big enough to start um, a company um, to escape poverty and so on. So that's it's, it's inherently limited. What it can do is what economists like to call smoothing out income variability a very technical term that has a very human side, right? So this is about keeping your children in school and not pulling them out um, so that they help with work um, when, when your income, your family income is low and, and thereby giving them a better future. Um, this is about avoiding being evicted from your home um, because you can, after all, make, make rent somehow or paying your utility bill, right? So these... These things about being able to get this extra cash at the end of the month, they won't get you out of poverty, but they can make it less, um, less awful. Okay, good. Um, I want to be sure to leave some time for Q&A, so I'm, I'm going to skip to my final question. And I want to ask you um, what you think societies can do to um, you know, realize their credit systems in such a way that makes them more just. What are some of the ameliorative actions that we could take? So I think the, the first thing to realize is that an egalitarian credit system is a credit system that is embedded in a broader economic system that is otherwise fair. So one thing you can do to make the credit system a lot more fair is to make the wealth distribution more fair, right? As we have seen, big determinant of whether you get access to secured credit is whether you have assets, so fix that and, um, and you have a fairer credit system also. So thinking about the credit system in isolation is, is not a good idea. Practically, 
you know, before we uh, bring about this uh, egalitarian distribution of, of wealth, um, the first thing we can do is to reduce the dependency on credit for access to basic needs. So you don't want a society that needs people to take out credit in order to get health care or to get basic education. Um, those are all things that credit isn't for, um, where it isn't really a useful way of, of distributing resources. This should be um, dealt with differently. The another way is to strengthen labor markets. A really awful thing that can happen with um, credit systems is that credit takes over where wage growth falls short or where real wages shrink. Right? Credit is not a good replacement for for wages. So you want you know strong labor markets, and then um, at some point topics come in that that are often um, top of the list, like fair lending practices. Um, addressing biases in, in credit distribution, algorithmic bias, and so on. Um, so I think those would be my top points. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, I think we should um, turn to um, questions from the audience here. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lisa and Marco. Yes, now we can open the debate. I see there are uh, questions coming from the audience. The first one is Stefano Merlo. So thank you, Stefano, for being with us today. Yeah, um, thank you so much. This is really, really interesting. I'm really looking forward to to reading the chapter and getting a little bit more in the uh, the nitty gritty of the of the argument. I, I guess I had two points. I think um, I really like the distinction between the secured and unsecured lending. Um, I was wondering if I could press you a little bit more onto the this distinction and to which extent do we have to, in a sense, naturalize it as a necessary feature, because one could argue that the distinction between having or not a collateral um, is could be, for instance, a result of more or less liquidity. So a collateral is available there and one can turn it more easily into something that can be sold. So it's liquid. So rather than seeing as a dichotomous distinction is more on a continuum be, rather than having collateral, non-collateral is more or less collateralizable um, assets. And to that extent, whether the distinction is something that should factor in your potential for change, what institutions should be there to facilitate um, allowing people to get more credit. Um, and so the reason that I was asking this is it was I was slightly unconvinced that the paper that you read that gave you the light bulb um, can be used as a as a fact of nature, that this is, uh, so to say, there's not, there's something immutable about the need for collateral. Um, thanks. Can you say a little bit more about the link between liquidity and collateralizable assets? Mm -hmm. I think I got that. that yeah, part. so I, I completely buy the distinction that a collateralized asset uh, carries a lot less risk for the insurer. Um, so, and I think that's I entirely there should be captured as a basic fact of a theory of justice around this. What I find less convincing is this neat distinction between collateralized and uncollateralized as two dividing lines. And I was wondering if this uh, quality that collateralized assets have um, is actually a result of specific institutions that the state defends, uh, private property upholds. Uh, and that therefore should be one of your variable in your uh, uh, theory. So something that we can attack politically to say, well, maybe we can do something to, for instance, um, you know, um, I mean, this might be a bit far fetched, but, you know, we've got central banks that did, to have some certain leverage over what is counted as good or bad collateral. And to that extent, couldn't they, for instance, offer credit to our citizens that do not have collateral? Yeah, so so that is one way, right? So you can have a third party stepping in and almost providing this assurance for you. In many countries, student loans work on that model. You're just a student, you don't have any collateral, but you still get cheap credit. Why? Because the state um, provides guarantees. And then you might say, wonderful, we tricked the distinction. Now we escaped it. But the truth is that for taxpayers, 
that is a really expensive scheme. So in the UK, for instance, um, the government loses about 50% uh, on every student loan they, um, they give out. It's a great scheme and, you know, it's low interest rates and all of these good terms, but someone pays for it. Um, there are other ways of, of trying to make that distinction a little bit less harsh. So you can, for instance, have conditional bonds, right? Where you're saying or like other, other forms of conditionality built into loan contracts. And there are ways of tinkering. I think for me, a big insight was to realize that once you make your loan contract less than pretty, pretty strict, um, you incur additional costs because lenders start to monitor and to appraise and to assess. Um, it doesn't need to be perfectly, awfully rigid. Um, and so you know, one way of making it a little bit more or less rigid is how you design your bankruptcy system, for instance. If it's easier to um, uh, uh, get debt, forgive me, uh, get debt forgiveness through bankruptcy, you might think of that as a way of making credit terms less rigid. But it needs to be pretty rigid so that people don't think twice and don't do too much monitoring before extending credit. Otherwise, we'll pay for that monitoring. Okay, so thank you, Stefano, and thank you, Marco, for your answer. And now uh, uh, I see Bollywin with, with a question, so you can go on. Thanks so much, uh, Marco, for this very lucid uh, explanation of uh, work that I already know quite well. But I do have a question for you, and that is whether you could explain a little bit more about the exact structure of the right to credit and maybe the angle that I'd like you to use here is to contrast it with um, a right to equality, a right to non-discrimination. Uh, for some of the people might think that all you want to get out of the right to credit is something you would already get out of a right to non-discrimination. If if people get uh, credit, if, if two people get credit, uh, but, uh, if, if two people in the same situation uh, and only one gets credit, the other doesn't get credit, then you might say, well, that's an obvious case of discrimination. Um, uh, how is your right to credit doing more than only uh, prohibiting uh, financial service providers from doing exactly that. Yeah, thank you. So the so this is what the right to credit demands of lenders, right? That they don't discriminate on arbitrary grounds. But it also it it, it first and foremost is a right that is held um, with the state as the duty bearer on on the other side. So the state has an obligation to make sure that you can become creditworthy for certain purposes. It doesn't mean that it needs to make sure that everyone gets credit in any amount for uh, any purpose, regardless of their creditworthiness, but, they, but the state has the obligation to give people a path for becoming creditworthy um, for um, purposes that, that are important from the perspective of justice. And here is the, uh, the crucial distinction to a mere um, uh, right against discrimination. Okay. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Bodwin. And now I see Aaron with a question. Hi, Aaron. Uh, you are muted, I guess. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. cool. Thanks. Sorry to talk to you from in bed. It's pretty early here in California. <laughs> um, but great, great, Marco. I'm really glad you're working on this. This is, those are many really good points. Um, so, so great. Um, can you say, say more about what you think about sort of what you might think is broader um, public banking kinds of measures that would, um, in which case, say a public bank could be a central bank, it could be a development bank, it could be a city or local public bank, or um, where they're directly issuing credit, meaning they're giving loans in the, in, for a borrower. Um, I mean, you mentioned the case of student loans, you know, which, which um, I mean, someone pays and stuff, but there's ways of running public, any, like any bank. You, if you run, uh, so there's, depending on which loans are issued, 
um, that can be, uh, you know, or an interest rate return that pays for other loans that are issued for those where there's a, where there's a default rate. So some of the loans can be just given as grants. Some of the loans can be, um, and the, or overall the whole loan portfolio can be can be profitable or be um, at least be neutral. It doesn't have to be run in a deficit. It could still run at a deficit, like a student loan case, if the public interest um, in having more people go to college is great enough, you know, it might be okay to take like a 50% loss on student loan repayments. That's just the price of education, you know, like as it were for society. Um, that's not sort of straight on the taxpayers either because the, a public bank um, would be issuing its own promissory IOUs and then swapping them against each other at different interest, you know, for getting different interest rates and waiving some, some of them, turning some into grants. Um, things like that. So this isn't sort of a simple matter of like there's spending that has to be tax financed. I mean, this can all be run technically with no no collateralized balance sheet if it's backed by the money issuing central bank. But it, but if the if the bank is collateralized in some way, it sort of can all be done for public purposes um, just by the normal techniques of banking. I mean, that sort of sidesteps some of the dynamics that you get within private, you know, provision of, uh, of credit to, to borrowers, which, which, in which case all the considerations you mentioned apply. So anyway, if you just want to, if you want to just invite, just invite you to address some of these public banking so um, dimensions. Very, very deep waters, right? Thank you, Aaron. It's, um, so, so what I said, I think we agree about that applies to private banking. So to, to lending institutions that have a, um, a hard budget constraint themselves. In those cases, the, so I think it's only a loan, uh, it's, it's, it's only credit if there's an expectation that collectively the borrowers repay all of the principal issued and the interest that the bank needs to make the loan. Um, otherwise, the bank won't meet their hard budget constraint. Now, what you bring up is, don't we have a an MMT way out of here, right? Can't we have public provision of credit and then sidestep some of these rules? Um, and I just- It's not MMT, by the way, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so, so yeah. I'm not sure. I'm, yeah. I'm 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 slightly less optimistic than than you are that that works. But this is what I mean with uh, very deep waters. I also don't feel um, confident enough about that. So so I think all I want to say is I think this applies to privately provided credit. And when we meet in New Orleans, you need to explain to me <laughs> and sidestep this um, outside of that system. Cool. Okay. Sure. Okay, so I see another question coming from Santiago Mejia. Hi, Santiago. Hi, uh, how are you? I'm fine, so, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk, Marco. And I wanted to just express a certain kind of dissatisfaction with your solution, which might be correct, but it's like, well, the best way of addressing the unfairness in credit is by just addressing the unfairness in society. I mean, like, well, we were hoping that you would give us some tools that through the credit that would happen, right? Instead of like waiting for the justice to happen. So I had a, I don't know, like, you know, it seems that I wonder if you could say more. And on the other hand, I had a question about, there's a very important set of credit that is uh, poverty. It helps people to get out of poverty. It generates a lot of like wealth for society. And that is like, you know, VC credit, like credit for, you know, uh, entrepreneurs. And, and those are typically not collateral. Like, you know, entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley get tons of money and they have no collateral, right? And I wonder what, whether you can say something about them in general and also whether you can say something in particular about a, a strategy of governments to actually try to sort of like create funds to invest in like VC uh, companies, not in VC companies, invest in like, you know, uh, uh, startup companies. Uh, with an eye to sort of like, you know, making, uh, distributing the, the credit in a way that's like poverty restricting because, you know, they generate sort of like 
particularly good things for the community and for the entrepreneurs, but also could be allocated in a way that might be, I don't know, yeah, more fairly distributed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two great points. So first point, I think I share the dissatisfaction entirely and it's really important to me to, um, to bring that out. So historically, there was um, a couple of times great enthusiasm about how maybe credit can solve all of our problems with our uh, feudalist economic systems. Uh, Saint-Simon and some of the people that followed Uh, him was very enthusiastic about credit and maybe that can help the workers to uh, finally displace the capitalists and make the world better and so on. Um, and I think that can't work. But you see this, this kind of thinking in a lot of um, applications today and startups that tell you, you know, we're going to fix finance through this or that financial in, uh, engineering feat and then uh, all of Africa will be affluent out of a sudden. Um, I think that's too optimistic. I think credit isn't, isn't the way to do that. Now, the second point that you, that you made was um, about investment. So as you say, when you're an entrepreneur, it's not collateralized. Most of these companies fail. Still, they got a lot of money. Why? Because they don't get credit. They get investment and they get it from VCs. And their business model is, okay, nine out of 10 of you guys will fail, but one of you will make me a lot of money. And that works if you can push all of these 10 people to um, try and achieve an outcome that is, least, that is at least 10x. So you at least need to make 10 times as much money out of the investment that you got from your VC. So the education that people that aren't entrepreneurs try to get won't get them a 10x return. It's going to get them a 1.5 uh, return. The houses they buy won't get them that return. So that's a very different thing where you're sharing risks, you're living with lots of people failing and some people being great successes. And that's a, that's a fundamentally different um, kind of financial product compared to To credit. There's some that try to mix them, but right? Islamic finance tries to mix that a little bit. We're not doing interest rate, we're not doing interest, we're really almost like co-investors. And that um, that can be interesting. It's typically not cheaper for people taking out um, the the financial product, the 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 loan start, as it were. Could I follow up, Emiliano? Okay, yes. So I I don't see like and, and the Islamic example is great as, as having a very clear distinction between investment and credit, right? And some of the stuff that seems promising in paper and but I haven't seen it success succeeding in practice is like state run funds to invest in entrepreneurs. And and I don't see why, at least in principle, States couldn't have funds that invest in entrepreneurs that might not have sort of some of the credentials, but have kind of like the backgrounds and the weeks, you know, that seems to suggest that they could actually, uh, yeah, create a, a successful company. And I wonder if you could say something about that or, or if you address it already, like to just elaborate. I, I could splout some Hayekian um prejudices um about the state's ability of having the kind of information you need to to pick successful entrepreneurs but that won't um be news to anyone um i think um that that is yeah but other than that i don't have a huge amount to say other than um they're very successful uh state run um banks from germany the kfw Uh, the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, incredibly important bank, structurally very important for the German economy. Um, so handing out loans, the state can play a very, very important role and also in guaranteeing loans for big infrastructure projects and so on to de-risk investments for, for companies. 
that is something that, that the state's actually quite good at. Um, the US just tries to learn this from um, companies that are doing this for, for a long time already. Um, so I think that there is potentially a role for the state there. Okay. So thank you, Marco, for your for this this answer. Maybe there is just a curiosity. Can I ask a question? Just a curiosity. I was wondering uh, whether or how your your framework uh, deal with um, the credit trap and. Um, I don't know if you have uh, some thoughts about this. Um, so when you're saying credit trap, you're thinking about sovereign debt. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. When uh, the, the financially fragile people access to credit, they, they don't pay it. And so they need a, another credit to pay the credit. Okay. And so the, the trap oh. is... Yes. Um, so that is... Um, that is really important context here as well, right? So maybe to zoom in again on the case of um, unsecured credit and what the potential benefits, but also pitfalls of those are. So I think most people think, first of all, about the downsides of this. And those downsides are absolutely real, right? So you get a payday loan, it doesn't go so well, you need the next payday loan. And before you um, know what happens to you, there are enforcers um, uh, trying, uh, chasing after you and you lose your home. And all of these stories are real and all of them happen. There's predatory lending, there are these traps. Now, um, some states in the US try to crack down on this by just prohibiting um, these types of high interest, unsecured loans, sometimes called payday loans, for instance. And there are studies because it's almost like a natural experiment of some states in the US banning them and some states of the US not banning them. And those studies try to look at the welfare gains or losses um, for poor people um, in these two different regimes. And the basic finding is, on average, it's bad for poor people to ban high interest credit. And it's bad because now you can't avoid addiction and you can't get this really expensive loan, but that's your best option right now. But for some people, for a significant minority of people, it's good to ban it because they would otherwise have ended up in a spiral. They might have taken out credit for no... Um, terribly necessary reason. So now they avoid being in, in a bad situation um, because they can't have uh, access to this financial tool and it's actually better for them. So those, those people also exist. Um, in general, in the mean, most people don't fall in that trap. Um, so most poor people don't fall into that trap, but they benefit. Thank you much, Marco. That's, that's interesting. So I, I don't see other questions coming from the audience. And so maybe we can stop here and thank Marco again. And also, of course, Lisa for this insightful interview. And it was very, I mean, dynamic and, and I liked it. And uh, I, I want to thank all of you, Lisa, first and foremost, for preparing uh, this wonderful interview and fantastic questions. It was so much fun. And Emiliano, you for, for running this and all of you for coming. Yes. It's a great discussion. Yeah, thanks for thank coming. you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye-bye.